Hello, my name is Filippo and today I'm gonna show you a good way to get really loud masters of your music. I'm now gonna play you the three tracks that I mastered using my mastering chain and the three commercial records that I used as reference tracks. Here in this little box on the left you can see the RMS level of uh, the various tracks which doesn't necessarily mean loudness but gives an idea of how much the track is compressed. Okay, here's the first one. As a reference track for this first song I used Danny California by Red Hot Chili Peppers because it's very famous and it's also very loud. Then this other track. As reference track for this one, I chose Bangarang by Skrillex because it's extremely famous and probably the loudest thing I have in my iTunes. And then the last one is a softer sounding song. I compared this song to Overgrown by James Blake, which isn't particularly loud, but it resembles the sound, so I thought it was appropriate. In my opinion, mastering shouldn't be considered as that final treatment that makes your music sound amazing, that it transforms it into commercial records. It shouldn't fix your mixes. Because you can do that in the mix where you have a lot more control and rather than fixing, you can adjust things. A good way to get into that mindset is by using a simplified mastering chain on your output as you start a mixing programming session. This is extremely useful for several different reasons. For example, you won't have to constantly change the volume when you listen to something on YouTube and then you go back to your session or iTunes or whatever else you're using. But more importantly, you'll get immediately a good idea of how your song is gonna sound at the end. Because obviously compression on a master changes the balance of things. It changes the frequency response of things. So because you'll have to compress your master anyway at some point, just do it right at the beginning and work into it. This is the logic session of the first mix I played you. And uh, 
my typical chain on the master consists of an EQ high passing everything at around 30 Hz just to get rid of some useless low end. Then a compressor with medium slow attack settings, medium fast release, a ratio of about 2 to 1. The knee doesn't really matter, I just keep it in the middle. And then the threshold obviously adjusted depending on how much gain is going into it. And then a limiter, I use this one because I like how it looks. I keep just the default settings and I probably push it a bit harder than I would normally push a limiter. I just use it to get my mix as loud as commercial records. Then I use a multimeter which is a frequency spectrum analyzer. Obviously trust your ears first but using a meter is useful. And in general commercial records have a relatively flat frequency response across all bands. Maybe not all the time but it's very rare that some frequencies stick out a lot compared to the others. So keep that in mind. Obviously there are some tracks that sound very good even if they have a completely messed up frequency response but that's rare. As you can see the frequency response is relatively flat, not exactly flat but it can be approximated around this line. The limiter is working harder than it should, it's modifying the sound a little but it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to bounce the mix through this uh, plugin chain. It is simply giving me a clearer idea of how this mix is going to sound at the end. Work as if what you're hearing is an already mastered version of your song and don't add plugins to the master. If there is too much bass, act on bass instruments rather than cutting the bass on the master. Or if you want your mix to sound wider, find the instruments that you can widen and act on those, not on the master. When you're happy with your mix, bypass all the plugins on the master output, doesn't really matter if you bypass the multimeter or not, and bounce it as a 24-bit, 44.1 kilohertz. Take a break, have a tea, have a coffee, sleep, do whatever you want, and just refresh your ears, which might take even a couple of days. Then start a new session, import your mix, and also import a commercial record that you like and sounds relatively similar to your mix, to use as a reference track. Okay, so create a new session and import your mix and the reference track. In this case, it's the first tracks I showed you. So the rock, pop rock track and Danny California by Red Hot Chili Peppers. Then take a look at the waveform just to make sure that it looks even and nice and it doesn't have massive peaks that are too much bigger than some other ones. This wave looks pretty normal to me. If it does look strange, if there is stuff that's sticking out too much, you might consider going back to the mix. Then I put a spectrum, frequency spectrum analyzer on the master output. And uh, this plugin, you can use whatever other plugin just to analyze the RMS level of the track. I use it on the master output so I can quickly compare the frequency response and the RMS level of the reference track. And then the first plugin is a compressor. I'm going to show you the chain I use, uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't do this exactly the same things using different plugins. So uh, I start out, I use two compressors. First, a compressor just to tame the whole wave and just to glue all the sound together. And then the same compressor, but with different settings after the EQ. The reason being... Uh, the fact that I first want to take all the wave and just soften it and gel it together nicely and the second one to just get some more compression going. The settings on the first one, I use the fastest attack allowed by this compressor, a very small ratio of just 1.5 to 1 
and a very, very slow release. With a soft knee, this is a feature that only these compressors got, which uh, allows it to, if you can choose to compress the high frequencies more, or a bit, a bit more, or just across the full frequency spectrum, I just keep it in standard settings. And then I adjust the threshold to get about maximum of 3 dBs of gain reduction. But as you can see, the compressor is constantly working. So the song is constantly inside the compressor, and that's because it's got a very fast attack and a very slow release and a very small ratio. So it's constantly inside the compressor and it's just being slowly tamed from this compressor. The second one has got the slowest attack possible, a higher ratio, in this case I'm using 3 to 1 because I know that I want to compress this track quite hard, and a relatively fast release, not the fastest one but faster than the first compressor. In this one I'm using a harder knee so that the compressor is more reactive and is more is harder in the way it works. And I use a little bit of um, high pass in the sense that it's compressing the high frequencies more. I adjust it to get a maximum of 2 dBs of gain reduction. And this compressor only works in louder passages of the song or only on the peaks, as you can see there. Then I insert an EQ between the two compressors. In this case I'm using Pro-Q because I like the way it looks. I set it on linear phase because generally linear phase EQs are cleaner sounding, softer sounding and it's what you'd want on a master channel. Uh, in mastering you don't want to change the sound of your mix radically. If the EQ you're using has got uh, mid-side capabilities, turn them on because it's useful to use mid-side on a master. And then I do the standard high pass at around 30 Hz and I also do a high pass on the sides around 200 Hz because you don't really need stereo information below that they just add phase issues and it's just better to cut them and before adding frequencies I prefer to insert the limiter because obviously an EQ works in a different way when you're limiting after it so I wait to have the limiter inserted first as a limiter I always use uh, the built-in limiter in Ozone and I set it on clipping settings using the IRC3 algorithm. Again, you could use whatever other plugin you want to clip. You could use uh, the, the Dynamic Spectrum Mapper, you could use FabFilter Pro L or whatever else you know that does clipping in a good way. Consider this as your waveform with your nice transients going in this direction, boom, boom, boom. You know, nice, this could be like kicks or snares or whatever, just the transients of your track. When you use a clipping limiter, what happens is this. This. While when you use a standard limiter, you do this. So let's take a look at the two waveforms, or the two pieces of cheese. The one that was clipped, still retains a shape so yes it's not as punchy and as dynamic as it was before but it does have a shape while the other one that was limited using a standard limiter so just pressed down lost his shape so we could say that this one lost all the punch and is rounded and doesn't sound nice while this one yes it's less dynamic but it's still retaining a shape but let's say you have music that doesn't have particularly punchy transients and is more based on atmospheres and reverbs and soundscapes. In that case, clipping might just destroy it. Because if I do that to a waveform like this, I'm left with nothing. I just have really long squared shapes. So that might simply be the case to not make your song so loud. Some other mastering tutorials on YouTube suggest to use limiting after clipping, just to finalize the track. In my opinion, that's stupid, in general, because you get the downsides of clipping, which is added the distortion, and the downsides of limiting, which is just taking punch away from your track. So let's say I have my clipped track, and then I limit it, I'm just taking all the life out of it. With the clipping limiter, I turn it up until it sounds bad, I can hear some 
very audible distortion and then I back it off a little. Around there sounds loud and fine to me. Then it's time to compare with the reference track. So I let it run through this whole section, analyzing it with this RMS meter. Black bandana, sweet Louisiana, robbing on a bank in the state of Indiana. She's a runner, rebel and a stunner, on them everywhere saying, baby, what you gonna? Looking down the barrel. Okay, so it's about minus 9 RMS in the verses and around minus 5 in the chorus. I try to get it, my track to the same level. Does the reference track sound louder, brighter, wider, more dense in the mid-range? Or maybe it simply sounds better? Or maybe yours sounds better? Well, in that case, you can just bounce and you're done. But let's say like you're missing some air, or you'd like your track to, to be different, to have more width, to have whatever, or to have even more volume. And you already tried everything you could in the mix session to get it sounding as good as you could, and pushing more gain into the limiter introduces too much distortion. Okay, so it's probably time to go back to the EQ. Um, I think I want to add some mid-range around 1K, that area, and probably add some top end. Remember to use wide curves as they're often more natural sounding. Now try to consider the frequency spectrum as a steak dish where fat is uh, bass and the side is obviously low mids. The steak is mid high frequencies, the most important ones for our ears and the salt, well obviously high frequencies. When making a steak dish it's all about balance. You need the right amount of fat to fry it nicely, you need a good side because you know without a side it's not a full steak experience. Then you obviously need a good steak, a nice sirloin steak and you need to season it and you need salt for that because a steak without salt is not complete. But with things like salt and fat it's easy to overdo as well as it's easy to overdo with high frequencies and low frequencies. Just be careful when you're mixing to keep a nice balance otherwise well you might get some toilet issues. I'm now happy with the way the track sounds, but I'd still wish it to be a bit more dense sounding, especially around the mid-range, more like Danny California, which I think sounds that way because of the analog audio path used in its recording. I don't know, but I believe it was done that way. And I generally use uh, Ozone's built-in exciter to get this. Uh, but you can use any other saturation or exciter plugin. Just make sure you're running it in parallel. This one can be run in parallel and is also multiband, which is a very good feature. So I turn it on, I set it on 
triad um, algorithm, which is supposed to simulate 12 AX7 uh, preamp tubes. And um, I put it on oversampling just because there's the option and I don't know, my CPU can afford to do it. And uh, then I put a little bit of exciter on across all frequencies, just a little bit and in parallel, which usually helps in adding a bit of density to the track, just like that. And then I work from this. We were people dead. might seem like a lot but it's actually not that's my opinion and it's just adding some nice density to the song try to view exciter and saturation processes as a dessert they're nice but it's also nice to have a lot of them to overdo and just in the same way as when overdoing with salt and pepper you might end up having some toilet issues <laughs> I'm now happy with the density of my mix, but I wish it was a bit wider. So widening a stereo mix can easily end up messing up with the phase correlation. So it's much better to do it with a multiband uh, stereo imager, like the one built in in Ozone, because you can safely widen frequencies above about seven kilohertz. I do it around above eight kilohertz in this case. You can just widen a lot, you can make your mix sound a lot nicer, especially when using headphones. It just opens up the top end of the mix. It also adds a bit of top end, which is nice sometimes. So I'd much rather use a, a multiband one. So I just, as you can see, that band above 8K, you can widen a lot from up there. We were people dead. As you can see, it's not messing up with the phase correlation and uh, it's just spreading the top end nicely. I brought it down so that it's, it uh, widens a bit more. You can do that. Yeah, it's 100%. It might sound, it might look weird, but it sounds good. If the frequency range is a stake and exciters and saturation plugins are a dessert, well then Stereo imaging processors are like wine. Again, it's easy to overdo. But when you overdo with wine, you might get drunk or have some toilet issues. <coughs> Nowadays, most playback systems are stereo, but it's not a bad thing if your mix translates well to mono. So when you do change the stereo image of your mix. Always make sure it translates decently to mono. In this case it does change quite a lot, but in mono you can still hear everything you need to hear, you've got just less highs, 
to be honest, I don't care that much because very few people have mono playback systems. So it sounds fine to me. Now, let's say you're happy with uh, the sound of your track, but you'd like to make it a little bit louder. Pushing the limiter more introduces too much distortion. So it might be the case to insert a multiband compressor. I generally don't like using them because I feel like they take away too much punch from the track. And when I really need to use them, I'd rather go back to the mix and fix whatever needs more compression there. But they can be useful tools. Um, in this case, I'm going to use Ozone's built-in multiband compressor, but you can use any other multiband compressor you have. It doesn't really matter as long as they're multibands. Um, I tend to uh, use three bands on most material because if you're going to use more than three bands, it means that there are problems in the mix that needs solving. So in that case, you might just go back to mixing rather than trying to solve the issues at the mastering stage. Uh, maybe if the track's got a lot of sub-bass content, I might split it around here and add another, another band just to treat the sub-bass individually. But in this case, this is just a standard pop rock song and doesn't really need any treatment, any separate treatment for the sub-bass. Then in terms of settings, just think about it as the stake, where the stake is mid-high frequencies, so it's the most important frequency uh, range of your mix. So compress mid-highs a bit less so that they can breathe more, while very high frequencies, in this case above 8K, and low mids and lows, you can compress them a bit harder. So I set the ratio here, let's say a ratio of about 3 to 1 on low mids and lows, about 3 to 1 also on the very high frequencies and 1.5 on the mid-high frequencies. Then obviously adjust the threshold depending on on the track. See, I'm having a maximum of 3 dBs of gain reduction on bass and low mids. Around 1 dB, maybe 2, not too much in mid highs. Same with the very high frequencies. Just try to not kill your mix and use your ears while you're doing this. Then obviously, because you compressed your mix more, you should be able to push the limiter a little bit harder without introducing too much distortion. But that That sounds really loud and not distorted to me. Maybe I'm dumb, but it doesn't sound bad to me. Let's compare it to the reference track. Black bandana, sweet Louisiana, robbing on a bank in the state of Indiana. She's a runner. Rise up and sing, but you feel free to stand up and sing it. Just another way to survive. Yeah, that sounds good enough to me, loud enough to me. 
then regarding the output settings I wouldn't recommend to set the margin above p minus 0.3 dBs the only reason being that any future conversion to lossy formats like mp3 or uploading it to YouTube or whatever else will allow some peaks to go through that barrier and if the limit is already at zero you may get harsh digital sounding distortion to be honest I can't really hear the difference between something that's got the margin at minus 0.3 and zero but at the end of the day the difference in volume between 0 and minus 0.3 is definitely unnoticeable and it doesn't cost anything more and you're just... It's, I, it's just good practice, in my opinion. And the same thing goes for intersample peak limiting. If you have the option on your limiter and you can't hear any difference in sound and your computer can handle it, just turn it on. It might be useless, but uh, as Gabriele D'Annunzio used to say... I am a luxurious animal, and anything that is useless is to me as essential as breathing. The same thing regarding dithering. Uh, I normally just bounce it down to s standard 16-bit 44.1 and use this dithering option given by Logic. Doesn't make any difference in sound, but... It's just a standard procedure. As I said in the beginning, preparing a good mix is by far the most important thing and it probably represents a good 99.9% .9 of the final sound. But this technique surely helps in reaching that finished sound when you want to get something really loud. And it's flexible enough to be used on a wide variety of music styles. The other tracks I showed at the beginning of this video have been mastered in exactly the same way with uh, the same compressor, the same EQing and uh, the same second compressor and uh, always Ozone as the last plugin using the multiband compressor, the stereo imager, the exciter, just all of them in this case. Yeah, the multiband compressor is used in mid-side just to compress the mid signal more Sure, it doesn't sound maybe as punchy or as loud, but it's also due to difference in the mix. Bangarang is slower, it's got a snare tuned lower, the synth programming is different and possibly better. So the difference are in the programming, not in the mastering. The tracks are just as loud. If I show you with the RMS meter, they are just as loud. <laughs> In my experience, there is no better way than this kind of mastering chain to achieve this kind of volumes. If you use standard limiting and not clipping, you won't get it, you won't keep the punch and you will just lose all the power in your mix. You don't have to make it this loud, you can just use this same kind of processing and make a standard mix without making it so stupidly loud. And again, the other example, which I didn't make so loud.
you can see, I used the exactly same, exactly the same type of processing on this mix, which is a lot softer sounding than the other tracks. F to reach an RMS of minus seven in the loudest part of the song, so it's not extremely loud, but it's using the same processing. And any other, using the standard limiting would have made it pump more and just to make it not sound so clear. As far as loudness goes, it's ultimately your choice to decide how loud to make your music. But keep in mind that loud records don't sell more. And today's charts demonstrate that very clearly. For example, the first two records on Billboard at the moment, Blurred Lines and Get Lucky, they both have an RMS level of minus 11 decibels, which can be considered almost quiet by today's standards. Hopefully you learned something from this video. If you didn't... Uh...